Hello there, and welcome to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series that recounts the history of the human presence in outer space, starting from the launch of Sputnik in 1957 until the present day. It's the 60th anniversary of human beings doing things in outer space, beginning in October of 1957. And I'm your hostess with the mostest on this flight across time and space as we retell the adventure of humankind taking its first steps out into the cosmos and the great beyond. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics 60 Years of the Space Age. Right, so I've got a great story ahead for y'all today as we begin part six of our retelling. Today's part of the story takes us back to the very beginning of the space race in the mid-1950s, 60 years ago. Hence where this podcast gets its title, 60 Years of the Space Age. We're still pretty much at the beginning of our story now as of episode six. At this point of the story, nothing from Earth has yet to have gone up into outer space. So far, the only things that have been invented at this point that has actually come close to becoming what you might call a spaceship, or to be more accurate with the technical name, an orbit-capable launch vehicle, were the V-2 Vengeance rockets, weapons of Nazi Germany built during World War II, and some prototypes, the early builds of rockets called the R-Series, invented by Soviet Russia. They were improvements of the V-2 design based on captured samples that had been plundered from the ruined German heartland in the wake of World War II. So you could imagine at this time, 60 years ago, the stars were still quiet with human involvement. No one or nothing from Earth had yet gone up into space. To most people living on planet Earth at this time, space was still a dream only to become the venture and experiment of the smart and brainy people in society, the scientists and engineers, these people that were sometimes a little too crazy about their ideas sometimes. And knowing the scientists and engineers, they do tend to be not just a little out of their heads, but maybe a lot. Trust me, I'm an engineer. To the average person 60 years ago, space was something that only appeared casually in stories and pictures and dreamscapes of artists, and the occasional free-handed scientist with some extra time to write about and ponder the what-ifs. What if we could go out to space? What if we could live there? How would we live there? Outer space was still very much a dream. Anything more than 100 kilometers up in the sky remained within the realm of extraordinary ideas and dreams. You might as well have put a sign up there saying, here be dragons, like they did on those old maps. Not really a place the average Joe and Mary could realistically devote their lives to or participate with in any way physically. The sky was quietly awaiting its first human visitor its first fellow traveler. But the world was about to change like it did in the decade before the 1950s. The space race was about to begin. Now take a second to think about what people do during quote-unquote races back here on Earth. The ones you would watch every four years on the Olympics, on TV. The athletes, the runners would line up at their posts, get in their best ready stance, put their hands and knees on the ground, raise up their butt, preparing to lunge forward and run. There would be like a referee guy with a gun called a starting pistol that would load a blank round into the chamber, and he would point this pistol to the sky and say, on your mark, get set, go, and pull the trigger. Bam! The space race was no different. There was some sort of trigger to it, a trigger pointed to the sky that would ignite a new time period in human history and very much change the perception and understanding of humanity's place in the universe 
and that trigger was the launch of Sputnik in 1957. We've never been the same since its firing, I like to think. This trigger to the sky was pulled the year before my father was born in 1958. The year before NASA was founded in 1958. So much will change since the time that this trigger is pulled that the world that will be introduced will be one bigger, faster, and louder than anyone from before could have even imagined. The space age, in its truest sense of the word and application, would begin with the firing of that trigger. And so the seconds, minutes, hours closely beat on. The racers ready at their marks, America and the Soviet Union, two nations having developed quiet suspicions and pent up untrust upon each other simply by the fact that the other existed. They looked upon each other across the gulf of geopolitical uncertainty, always planning and scheming the next raise in the stakes of their rivalry. The coming launch of Sputnik would be one natural step forward in that confrontation. Now, because nuclear bombs at the time were becoming smaller and smaller, their delivery mechanisms, the rockets, intercontinental ballistic missiles, could afford to be used for other things like going up into space. <clears throat> Morty. So I guess it's lucky for everyone on Earth that these big dealers of death were getting more minuscule in their shape and form. It was postulated that perhaps going into space would be a natural extension of the use of rockets instead of using them to blow up cities, like the Nazis did. Initially, as the stage was set, Soviet Russia was far more prepared and ready to go up into space than America. They were driven by this idea that communism, as this radically new attempt at creating a utopian society on Earth, would prove its worth and value by going into space. <laughs> the leaders of the Soviet Union thought that if their ideology and their way of life could facilitate a harmonious existence among the stars, then their ideologies of communism derived from Marx's utopia could no doubt provide a more harmonious existence on Earth. Not a bad idea at the time. I would chalk it up to one of the more nobler successes of communism and the Soviet Union. But ultimately, it was about the symbolism. Symbolism being something that the Cold War between Red Russia and America would be full of. From the space race to the Berlin Wall, those years between the 50s and the 90s would be full of symbolism. And it was the symbolism of a communist utopia on Earth, proven by one in space, that first gave the idea to the Soviets that maybe, just maybe, space was worth it. But of course, having a military advantage over America at the same time wouldn't be such a bad thing to gain either. And this idea of conquering the stars for the sake of ideology came at just the right time, too. There's a man we've been talking about in the past few episodes. We've dedicated entire episodes to his exploits. And his name is Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, a legend. He would marry at the right church at the right time on Sunday. This idea of communist utopia, idealism, and symbolism, he'd marry it with a device that he designed and built by the many people that worked for him, the R7 rockets. He was the chief designer. This wedding would take place under October skies in Kazakhstan at a place called Baikonur Cosmodrome. This place was built under total secrecy from 1955 to 1957, turning a once sleepy Soviet border town in Kazakhstan into a loud, gigantic spaceport complete with launch pads, hangars, and railways, all of which, well, most of it, it's still being used today. Sometimes this place, Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, would be referred to as Zvezdograd or Star City. Remember what I said about symbolism? Charming name though. Zvezdograd, Star City, a city to the stars. Anyway, this would be the place where Soviet Russia put its money where its mouth is in the space race competition, soon to go up in rocket smoke against its unaware capitalist rival in the West. The trigger to the sky of the space race would be pointed and fired, BAM, here at Baikonur Cosmodrome on a clear day 
in October of 1957. Lead up to the firing of this trigger had been going on for a few years. Under the leadership of Sergei Korolev, the creation of his rocket piggybacked on the work of the Soviet army to develop a long-range missile that could be fired at America, just in case. Just in case. Sergei Korolev was a hard-ass but patient, ex-con type of baller, gangster person that wouldn't take no as an answer. He had a savvy of maneuvering the political landscape of the ruling Communist Party in order to convince the Soviet generals that using those same missiles to go into space wouldn't be such a bad idea. Personally, I think it's a great idea. Ever since a boy, Korolev, just like his German-American counterpart, Werner von Braun, didn't just dream of space, he actually wanted to go there. And as the defining figure in the Soviet space program, he did everything he could do to explain, convince, and break down how to do it to the army generals that would foot the bill, that would actually pay for the rocket. The man was a savage, itching like an addict. He knew he had to have it going up into space. To him, it was kind of a craze. Ha, yeah. Rap. Up until this point, both sides of superpowers had been playing with the idea of going into space. Both America and the Soviet Union had, had been toying with the idea, but no one had really actually committed to it. No one had actually really done it yet. Some politicians had made promises, others gave big talks, but the reasons why the Russians are so significant in this story arc is because they were the ones that truly reached up to that gun and the trigger to the sky and goddamn, they pulled it and they pulled it hard. The Americans in the West had an inkling, a simple notion of sending a satellite up, at, up into space in commemoration of the International Geophysical Year of 1957. That was like a worldwide science collaboration festival between countries during that time. Because since Iron Father Comrade Stalin was now resting in his grave, people had nothing to fear and started to get together in order to share scientific ideas between East and West. It was a nice gesture, but ultimately the angle of science and cooperation and curiosity wouldn't be as instrumental towards starting the space race compared to the raw paranoia-induced competition between the Soviet Union and the, and the United States would be. We'll see this occur many times as we progress through the space race section of this podcast. Humans are just like that, and you present to them some unknown danger, and the greater half of them would probably jump and react in the most peculiar and sometimes spectacular ways. The Americans in the West would miss their mark, allowing the Soviet Union to plow its way into the history books 60 years ago. And that's what matters within those really close months in July, August, September, and finally October of 1957. The Soviets decided to pull the trigger first. But what actually happened wasn't really a loud bang and off you went into the stars. The Russians wanted to launch in May as proposed by Korolev. He wanted to be sure that he could get the advantage over the West. Korolev, heart pounding no doubt, as the world approached the eventual event date. The Russians would only green light the, the missions. The Russians would only green light the Sputnik mission if the test vehicles flew on two. Count them. One, two successful test flights. Flights one, two, and three all failed. As often with the rest of the world of science, usually when something goes wrong, that means you're probably getting something right. As long as you're writing down and recording the things that did go wrong, you've got a shot at making history. 
So that's my advice to all the aspiring scientists and engineers out there. Fundamentally, there's no room for pessimism in science when you get the wrong results. Now, after the fifth test flight of their rocket, they finally decided on the design they wanted to send into space. It was lighter by some eight tons. And even the design of the little traveler, Sputnik, about 100 kilograms at launch with just four antennas, was itself reduced from the size of an initial object called Object D that was 1,000 kilograms. And, and that carried a slew, a bunch of additional scientific equipment. Object D would later see flight into space as Sputnik 3. Now the plan was for the R7 Semyorka, that's the name of the rocket, Semyorka meaning little seven, to fly into space and more than 100 kilometers above sea level detach Sputnik from its payload fairing and begin transmitting some simple beeps, boops, beeps and boops back down to Earth and then complete some orbits, some trips around the Earth. It was an unprecedented science experiment and show of force at the same time conducted with intercontinental ballistic missile technology that could easily as well have been used to send a world-ending nuclear warhead to America, but instead it was going to send a 100 kilogram fellow traveler. And that's what Sputnik means. It's the pet name for Sputnik. It's fellow traveler. And this traveler would become a simple gesture to the heavens, to the world and to the United States of America that Mother Russia was not to be messed with. And this little traveler, this 100 kilogram object, was going to start the space age. The rocket was ready. All that was left was to sail into space with no one, not among the Soviet scientists and generals and the people at the Pentagon and any other person at the time really had any idea what would happen, what sort of amazing and unknown secrets they would discover up there because no one had really done it before and for every wrong or right reason that it was, it was to be done, all they knew was that it was go time as the R7 Semyorka loaded with a little traveler was led to the launch site that day in early October 1957. Humanity would be led into a new age and everything that would come after that would merely be an afterthought flirting on the contrails of an afterburner. If you enjoyed the type of content we have here on Science Epics, 60 Years of the Space Age, be sure to help us out by dropping a donation on our Patreon through the link down below. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.